Um, I'm Mary Glenn. And I'm Shama. And we are your fashion police for today. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be talking about fashion in Scotland and India today. Yeah. So a little bit about me. I'm Mary Glenn. I am a senior this year at UNC Chapel Hill. I studied abroad in Edinburgh, which is in Scotland, last spring. And my favorite fashion accessory is a good sweater. Ooh, I think I'm the one before yours. Yeah. Oh, go. <laughs> okay, so I'm Shama. I'm the class of 2021, so I'll be graduating college in two years. Um, my family is from India, so I've been there a total of about five times in my life, anywhere between four and eight weeks. So I've been there for a total in my life of eight to 12 months, and my favorite fashion piece is flannels. There we go. So we want you guys to start off by turning to a partner and discussing what you think clothing might be like in Scotland and India. So you could talk about maybe what patterns they might you might see or what kinds of clothes might be in common with clothes that you wear here. So just turn to a partner and discuss for maybe two minutes about clothing in the countries in Scotland and India. Thumbs up when they're done, yeah, so just give us a thumbs up when you guys are done discussing what you think. You're good? Okay. okay. There we go. Okay, so by the end of this presentation, we're hoping that you can identify key features of the clothing from the different countries, so the clothing from India and Scotland. Um, and also, we're going to have you guys explain some of the culturally and historically significant factors that have impacted different fashion trends in other cultures. And finally, the last thing that we want you to do is to be able to compare the clothing in American culture that we see here and the um, clothing in the other cultures that we're going to show you today. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is traditional clothing in India. So there are a lot of different types of traditional clothing, and we'll only focus on a few for men and for women. So for women, we have the sari, which is typically worn by older women. It's this long garment. We'll see a picture of it in the next slide that's wrapped around the body. It's typically a top and a skirt. Um, and then we have the salwar kameez, which is really popular. Nowadays, if people wear traditional clothing, it's a loose top that goes down to the knees with pants that are loose towards um, your thighs but fitted through the ankles. And for men, there's the kurta, which is like the male version, essentially of a solar kameez, which is long and loose fitting. It's a straight shirt and it's worn in different styles with different types of pants. And so we can see here, um, on the left, we have the bride wearing her sari, very traditional. In the um, middle, we have the salwar kameez, so we see the long top to the knees and the, um, and the pants. And then on the right side, we see the kurta, so that's um, a more like fancy type of dress. Um, the kurta can be simple or it can be like really embellished like you see in the picture. So that's probably something that he would wear to like a wedding. And for Scotland, I'm going to focus on the kilt, which is really widely known in Scotland. And um, it's actually known as the national dress of Scotland. So the word kilt is actually derived from a Nordic word that means pleated. And it's a long piece of wool fabric that usually features a distinct tartan or plaid pattern. And it's worn around the waist and wrapped around the body. So the, the older original kilts actually were worn more like Roman togas. So they're kind of wrapped around the waist and then worn over the shoulder. Um, and so the trend originated in the 16th century Highlands of Scotland, where male Highlanders who were fighting wore full length garments that were almost this cloak like garment gathered around the waist and then draped over their shoulders. And the fabric was prized for its versatility. So the excess fabric that's draped over the shoulder could be put over your head as like 
um, a cover for sun or rain protection. And it could also be used as a pillow or a blanket if they were sleeping or camping outside. And then aside from the kilt and tartan fabrics, Scotland is also internationally known for its cashmere production and Harris tweed, which is a fabric that's woven only in the outer islands of Scotland. And it's actually protected by its own act of parliament. So it's a very special fabric in Scotland. So now we're gonna to switch to more modern clothing now that we've talked about the traditional clothing. So modern clothing in India is very, very similar to what we see in American clothing. So people typically don't wear shorts despite the heat. It's very, very warm there. There are of course areas that are cold, but um, people typically wear long pants and if they're shorts, they're typically not above the knee for women or men. You see a lot of Western influences, so influences from England, influences from America in the clothing, especially in like the really um, upper city lifestyles. Um, and it's kind of a mix between the traditional and the modern. So you'll see like a kurta with jeans or a silwar kameez with leggings. You'll see a lot of um, mix between the traditional Indian and um, what we consider as American style clothing. Um, so from a historical standpoint, a lot of the changes in Indian dress are associated with British colonization. So India used to be a colony of England. And um, whenever that happened, um, seeing what the people, the ruling country wore and associating that with their country is a lot of what um, brought about this, this um, mix between the types. And from a more social standpoint, there's a lot of um, influence with connection throughout the world. So as time has passed, the world is more connected. We have planes, we can get to other countries way more quickly than we have before. We've got the internet. So more communication led to an adoption of Western styles of clothing. And culturally, Bollywood is a really big influence on fashion in India. So the adoption of Western styles in popular Bollywood films is what influences um, Western styles in the country itself. So the kilt has actually gone through a lot of modernization in the, throughout history. Um, it's actually become shorter throughout the years. So it's not fo a full length garment anymore like you might see in the highlands, in the 16th century highlands. It's actually tailored above the knee today. And the formal style of the kilt has also evolved over the years to incorporate different elements. So now we have like a waistcoat and um, a, a, like a, a small purse that's called a sporon that people usually wear for formal events. And the process of globalization has always changed, has also changed the way that people are recognizing the kilt as an acceptable form of dress to wear out at parties or casual wear or even like everyday attire for some people. Um, so the 1970s British punk movement was actually a really big um, push for this, the modernization of the kilt. So it's actually changed a lot in how people recognize tartan patterns and incorporate them into different styles. So now you can see tartan patterns that were originally used in kilts, now used in jackets or fitted pants or hats or purses and all this kind of stuff. Um, and while the kilt itself has gotten revamped into different styles, um, it's modernizing and breaking out of those historically um, associated roles that it was typically in. Um, in the highlands. So the charm of both um, cashmere and um, tartan and tweed is also changing. So um, in these pictures you can see some different elements of tartan patterns that are being used and in the next photos you can see kind of how the kilt has evolved. So up in the photo on the left there's different kilts that are camouflage, denim, leather, and then on the right, you'll see that's a runway shot from a 2013 fashion line. And that's a lot of tweed and tartan patterns coming together. And then in the bottom, there's a picture of the Harris tweed fabric that I mentioned earlier, which is being incorporated into lots of purses and jackets and stuff. So now we're going to talk about occasions. So in India, there is pretty much a different style for every occasion. So we're gonna talk about a few of them. So for weddings, you see the traditional red sari, which is the most universally recognized um, fashion piece from India. It's usually highly embellished. Sometimes it features green, um, red. You can see the flowers in her hair. Jewelry is really important. So whenever someone is getting married, they typically get a whole new sets of jewelry all gold for the most part. Um, and it's very elaborate, 
you like there's contrast between simple and elaborate in India, but this is one of the times where people really go all out, obviously, for their wedding. Um, so one really big difference also besides the red at weddings instead of white is that in India we wear white at funerals and typically it's very simple. It's just a plain like cotton salwar kameez or kurta, plain white pants. Um, and I'll explain some of the colors in a later slide, but the idea is that white is a pure color so this person is passing on and it's something that's pure and it's sad but it's also a moving on so for holy there's no particular dress you'll see people wearing all kinds of things but a lot of the time especially um in the past people would typically wear white so holy is the festival of colors so you see all of the color that um comes with the festival getting onto your white clothing so it's kind of a symbolism for the whole festival itself and then for Diwali, which is a festival that just passed, it's kind of like the Indian New Year's. Um, usually, um, tr like as a tradition, women wear sophisticated variations on the solar kameez or simplified versions of, versions of saris, which, is, which are called joydars. And a lot of the time, joydars are also worn by younger um, girls who maybe aren't old enough yet to wear a sari quite yet because they can't wrap the garment around their bodies the same way. Um, so we can see pictures here. So in the top left, we see something that would traditionally be worn to a funeral. So very simple white, um, the simple, um, it's called an odni. It's, a, it's the shawl. Um, and then the little boy, of course, he's wearing a little bit of color, but a lot of the time you can get away with color, but the idea is to have wear mainly white. So we see in the bottom picture, a picture of holy. So you see people wearing red, people wearing all kinds of colors. But if you notice in the middle, there's the person with the kind of funky colored afro that's wearing white. That's pretty common. Um, you can see like the color is staining his shirt and it's just a really big symbol of how um, color is coming into their lives. On the right side, we see the more elaborate version of the salwar kameez that I talked about. So she's wearing light blue, the top is embellished, the sleeves are um, mesh with like the embellished cuffs. So that's pretty common for festivals like Diwali. And then during the 19th century, Scottish kilts were typically a form of ceremonial dress worn mainly for weddings, special sporting events, and holiday celebrations. And we see that still today. So the kilt is still typically worn for special occasions. So um, the Highland Games is a big event where a lot of athletes and spectators will wear their traditional kilts and Kayleys as well. So Kayleys are traditional Scottish dances and both the dancers and the band will wear traditional Scottish kilts. And then also at weddings, the wedding party and typically the groom's side of the family will wear kilts to represent their family clan. Um, and typically at weddings, the bride will wear just a traditional um, or contemporary white gown, and the groom will wear his traditional Highland kilt, his kilt jacket, and his sporan, which is a purse that goes with kilts. And the Scottish kilt has also become a required uniform for many athletic teams in Scotland, including Scotland's Tartan Army soccer team. So it's really prevalent throughout the country as kind of like this icon of um, a clothing piece. And here's some images that you can see of people wearing these kilts. So on the left, we have a full formal attire with the kilt. So you can see that he's wearing a kilt jacket, a waistcoat, and the kind of funky looking purse on his waist. That's the sporon that I mentioned before. And then you can see that the kilt is just hanging right above his knees. So traditionally, if we're talking about back in the 16th century, that kilt would have been down to his ankles. It would have been very long. So now they've modernized and they're, very, they're just at the knees today. And the upper picture is a group of people at the Highland Games. So they compete in traditional Scottish sporting events. And they're wearing a full traditional garb with a kilt, a sporon, um, and different elements there that you can see. And the bottom right is a picture from a Kaylee, which is a Scottish dance party, essentially. And the band and then some of the spectators are also wearing kilts and different elements with tartan in them. So like I said earlier, we're going to move on to the significance of clothing in Indian culture, particularly the significance of the colors and more of like the embellishments. So red is often worn at weddings to symbolize fertility. So like the idea is that these two people love each other, they're getting married and they want to start a family. So red is the color of um, fertility, meaning like good luck in um, starting their family. 
Um, you'll also often see green more. Green is um, another symbol of fertility that's probably more common to us. So like green as a symbol of like fertility in nature. Um, and then white, like I mentioned earlier at funerals is worn for purity. So these people are passing on and it's this idea that um, death is a pure process and it's something that you're moving on from. Um, and then bangles. I love this story about bangles. So bangles are a symbol of love. Um, women typically wear bangles, but the more elaborate versions like you see in the picture on the right are worn. So they're typically worn in a pattern. So you see she has one bangle that's like kind of elaborate and then a, a bunch of blue bangles that are framed by the golden ones, or I guess they're silver, and then a statement piece and then a repeating pattern on the opposite side. So bangles are always worn. They're mixed and matched constantly. Um, and they're always worn in this pattern. Um, so another symbol for bangles is that they're a symbol of love. So a lot of the times brides will wear glass bangles for their wedding. And the idea is that the honeymoon ends whenever the last glass bangle breaks. Um, and then there's the bindi, which I feel like we're all pretty common with, but it's to symbolize marital status. So there's a difference between the colors in bindis. So red versus black is um, married versus unmarried. They're largely ornamental now. A lot of them come in different colors and come in, they used to be just simple circles, but now they'll come in um, small patterns that you just put on your forehead right between your eyebrows. Um, and they'll come in different colors. Women often will match them to whatever clothes they're wearing. And then there's henna. So henna is also another thing that's love and marriage. Henna is typically worn for weddings. So there's this um, story that the darker the color of your henna, once you take it off, the more that your future husband is going to love you. So that's kind of like the fun wedding tradition. <laughs> All right, this slide. <laughs> um, so back in 1746, um, the definition of a kilt really changed when King George, who was King of England at the time, imposed the Dress Act, which suppressed um, Highlanders' ability to wear a kilt. So he actually made it illegal to wear kilts in the Highlands. Um, but despite this, people still wore kilts as a symbol of protest against the British government. And so in 1782, the kilt um, the Dress Act was um, abolished. And since then, the kilt has stood as an international symbol of Scottish patriotism and pride for their country. So that still resonates today. So a lot of the, a lot of the references to kilts and like when you see people wearing kilts, it's associated with having a very strong Scottish pride and Scottish identity. And the tartan patterns are also very significant themselves. So they represent different clans, families, regions, or um, counties in Scotland. And today there's over 8,000 known tartan patterns. And just a side note, making a kilt in a tartan pattern is extremely difficult to do. A lot of it is done by hand. And the actual pattern um, as a symbol of the unity and strength of the clan, the region, and the county in Scotland, the, the tartan pattern is actually unbroken throughout the entire fabric. So it takes around 20 to 25 hours to make kilts because they're so complex and because this pattern has to remain unbroken. And they're nearly all done by hand still today. So it's a very significant fabric, has a lot of history, and um, yeah, it's very prevalent still today in Scotland. So we're gonna wrap up now with a little discussion activity. So we've posed two questions. You can talk about one with your partner. So our first one says, um, turn to a partner and discuss what types of clothing that we've discussed that people wear in Scotland. It may be related to a specific holiday. So what um, themes did we talk about that people wore specific dresses for? So you can choose any holiday we've mentioned and just discuss that with the partner. Or you can discuss a clothing item that has um, meaning to your culture. Is there some, is there another word? So like, to you or your culture. Yeah, so a meaning to you or your culture and explain its significance. Um, and whatever ideas you come up with, you guys can drop those in the chat and we'll discuss them with you. If you have any questions, let us know. And then you can just give us a thumbs up when you're done discussing with your partners or with your class.
So we do have one question about why do we have to wear different types of color colored clothing on holidays? So maybe if you can repeat um, a little yeah. bit more about the colors. Yeah, so um, the colors have a lot of cultural significance in India. So um, like I said earlier, white is worn for purity. So like when we in America wear, go to funerals, we wear black and black is our symbol of mourning. And so in that same way, they have significance in India. So um, the different colors are representative of whatever emotion that the holiday or the event is trying to convey. So white is worn because yes, people are in mourning, but it's this time of remembering this person's life and remembering what the purity of life is and um, honoring them. And while you're sad, still remembering that everything that their life stood for was really important and it's time to let them move on. Um, and then for weddings, like I'd mentioned, people typically wear red or gold. And so um, red is a really big symbol of, um, like I said, fertility. So it's this idea that these people are going to get married and start a family. And so those are just two common colors. There's not really a specific color associated with any other um, event, but a lot of events it'll be like shades of clothing. So Diwali is typically a time of like really like light, happy colors. Um, I can't really think of a time when the dress in India is very somber. It's always about um, like seeing the brighter side to things. So the colors just have a different meaning the same way that funerals do here. And another example for the United States, sometimes people wear like red and green around Christmas time mm -hmm. or they wear white white dress at a wedding so we sometimes do that do that too um the next question is why do they wear certain types of kilts at sporting events in scotland and france well yeah the kilt actually um when it originated it was a really great um alternative to pants because if um a warrior or a highland um army person got caught on something it was easy that he could rip it off or get away from it because he, he wasn't um, confined by pants, um, which are a little bit harder. And in the Highlands, um, it's very, it's very wet and like kind of very kind of nasty, cold weather all the time. So the fabric of kilts, which is wool, was also a very good um, fabric for that area. So it, it kept um, their legs dry and didn't hold on to moisture. So I think that um, the versatility of the kilt historically kind of transitioned into how can we incorporate it today into symbols that people still see. So I think it kind of got incorporated as into a sporting event because of kind of that historical element because it does represent Scotland on such a large and patriotic scale. Um, but also I think it's just it's just kind of a niche thing. It's it's something that Scotland can say, look, that's us. We're the we're the ones with the kilts. <laughs> so a lot of their sporting teams, mostly um, soccer, will be wearing kilts traditionally. So it's just um uh, it's just another way for Scotland to kind of distinguish themselves from other people and kind of relate that to their history. Do you want to go? I'm starting to get questions. If you want to go to the next slide, and then we'll yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So if you guys have any other questions, feel free to ask us in the chat. We're gonna answer them as best we can. You can stop the share the the red button at the top. All right, so the next question is um are the marriages still prearranged in India? So um, it depends on where you live, I guess, or like what your family's ideas of um, marriage are. So um, my parents actually are a prearranged marriage. Um, so that was a that was really common in older times, and it's still common today, especially in places in India that are a lot smaller that are maybe more close knit or the people in the um, town know each other um, better than we would in a town in America, like a bigger town. Um, so not all of them, 
I would say that it's moving more towards most of them not being prearranged, especially because people are moving around so much. So there's people from India who live in who live all around the world. So um, to answer your question short, um, yes, but not it's not as common. Um, and why do they have different patterns for different tribes or families in Scotland for the the um the kilts. Yeah, so that actually is an interesting um, little history side note. Um, so when I mentioned earlier that King George kind of had some animosity towards Scotland, he actually banned kilts for a while. Um, and then when that ban was lifted, um, another king eventually came to Scotland and had the association of kilts so strongly in his mind that he did kind of this tour of Scotland. And there was a guy, and I can't remember his name, but he basically went around to a lot of different clans in Scotland and said, look, you need to wear your kilts because the king's coming and he wants to see them. So what ended up happening was a lot of these weavers and um, just textile workers started making a bunch of different patterns because suddenly a lot of people were like, oh, or we're supposed to have a, an identity. We're supposed to have a clan um, kilt, a tartan pattern. So a lot of them are actually fabricated by different um, by different weavers in, I think it was like the 18th century. So the association to the clan does go back as far as around then, but as far as why they are that way, like why certain clans and certain families have distinct patterns, it kind of comes down to the weaver that made them and was like, oh, like this looks like a good one for you guys. So you guys take that. So it does have some history because it does go back to around the, the 1800s. But as far as why they are a certain pattern, it really just depended on whoever the weaver was making it and kind of how they agreed to make a pattern for a clan. So it's a very interesting, a very interesting history um, about how they came to be but ultimately it was just kind of um, a single person's decision just to make a certain pattern and they've stuck all through this day so they're pretty prevalent um so the next question is what is the origin of the bindi specifically the red um, bindi in the, the center of a woman's forehead in india um so i am not 100 percent sure on the origin but i think that it starts with a lot of the ancient scriptures in india so there's um the vedas which are like kind of like our version, like the um, Christian version of the Bible, but there are four of them. So the four Vedas each have like a different story to tell or each have a different ideal that they're representing. And a lot of the goddesses are depicted in that way. I'm not sure that it specifically says red bindis, but that's where they come from, is from um, religious um, portrayals of it. So the goddesses that are um, married, whoever first started making the idols, so they're... Um, like small idols that are in all of the temple, like all of the Indian temples. It's based on their dress and um, just a symbol of what, like a symbol of marital status of the goddesses that maybe aren't married or the goddesses that are. The question is, is Scotland still considered an extension of England? So maybe a little bit about the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Scotland is actually um, one of five countries that is part of the United Kingdom. And it is connected via land, so you can drive from England to Scotland. Um, it's just a border like you would see between states in the United States. Um, so it's free. You can go between the border if you're a UK citizen without having to check your passport or anything. So it is still connected by land, but it is not a part of England. So England is a separate country. Um, so there's England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and one other country that I'm forgetting in the UK. But Scotland is a part of the United Kingdom, but it is not a part of England, if that clarifies that. Um, and what is henna made of? Or can you tell us a little bit more about henna? Um, so traditional henna is made of um, like herb paste. So henna comes in this little tube that's like kind of triangular. Um, it smells very earthy. It's, um, it's, I'm not actually sure everything that it's made of, but it's, something it's something natural that a lot of it is like synthetic so very like people have made henna nowadays to make it so that it'll um add more color to your hands but in the traditional times it was made of um different crushed up herbs like made into a paste um what happens if you don't wear the traditional 
clothes or the right clothing to an event in India? <laughs> so I guess it would be pretty similar to like showing up to a wedding wearing a white dress when you're not the bride. Um, it's kind of awkward, I guess, in a way. Um, kind of like a social faux pas, something that you don't really do. So there's, like I said, there's some, um, there's some um, holidays and festivals where it's not really it's just a certain style of clothing it's not really like you have to wear this whereas like at a funeral like it is expected that you wear white um, so like you wouldn't show up to a funeral in America wearing like bright red or like yellow or something so it's more of like um, a respect thing for the people who are whether it's a wedding for like the bride and the groom and their families or if it's a funeral for the family of the person um, that was that they lost. Um, so I don't think that there's any specific actions that happen, but it's definitely um, it's definitely like a social like no no. Um, so the question is, why do men wear skirts in Scotland? So again, just again, why they do it, and maybe about reinforce when when they do and when they wear traditional mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. modern clothing. Yeah. So there's actually a distinction between a skirt and a kilt. So it does look similar to a skirt that you might assume, but it is a traditional um, piece of clothing in Scotland. So the kilt is worn because of its, um, when it was essentially when it became prevalent in the 16th century, a lot of these Highlanders are, are mountain villagers and they don't really have access to a lot of materials. So um, the way the kilt came about was it was this long piece of fabric that you could kind of wrap around your body and change and make it different styles like as you wish. So it was, it was this one piece of fabric that a lot of people could have when, if they didn't have a lot of money to purchase a lot of other clothes. And you can make it really versatile and wear it in a lot of different ways. So that's how the, the traditional element of wearing um, something that doesn't look like pants came about. So um, that's kind of how it started and it just continued because of that deep rooted history and the tradition with um, how people wore it. And then um, I know I focused a lot on like how the kilt has evolved and people wearing the kilts, um, but people in Scotland do also wear pants. It's, they don't always wear kilts all the time. It's just a very, a very historically significant part of their um, identity in this fashion piece. Um, but yeah, they're, they typically wear it um, if you're having a big event, like a big dance or a wedding or a big celebration, they'll, they're well, they will they wear kilts. Um, but some people like to wear them every day. Like when I was studying abroad, you could walk down the street and see people wearing kilts in 30 degree weather. And that was normal. And it's kind of like if um, some people like to wear dresses or skirts to school, and then some people just like to wear sweatpants. So it's kind of just depends on personal taste. And um, because the kilt is kind of evolving and, and using different fabrics like leather and denim and people are incorporating it into more modern attire, it's become more acceptable and kind of more common to see these different elements every day. So it's not totally uncommon to see someone wearing a kilt just every day, but I would say typically they only wear them for special occasions, really. And what do the men wear under their kilts? So <laughs> yeah, traditionally men would wear nothing under the kilts it would just be the fabric um but today it is most people wear are wearing undergarments or pants under their kilt um and then as far as like shoes and stuff are concerned they're, they'll wear like knee-high socks and like some hefty boots um but traditionally nothing under the kilts um and in india do they kill animals and give thanks for the meat um, so it depends on what parts of India that you live in. So the part that my family is from is um, like religiously vegetarian. So for the most part, um, the part of India that my family comes from does not kill animals because we don't eat animals. So there is still um, using like animal furs or not furs, but like using different parts of animals besides the meat. But I would say that in areas of India where they do kill animals, it's very common to see, um, especially in the more rural areas, that they do give thanks for the meat that they kill. Um, a lot of the time, though, it's like it's a lot like how we um, buy meat from the grocery store here. So um, it's not it's not so different from the way it is here. But they do still do that in other in parts of India. And do they celebrate Christmas in either of your countries? That's the question. No, not in India. We do not celebrate Christmas. 
They do celebrate Christmas in Scotland. They also have um, their bigger holiday though, I would say, um, is called Hogmanay, which is their equivalent of New Year's. So a lot of businesses might not give employees or workers Christmas off because Hogmanay is such a big holiday and that's just a week away after Christmas. So typically the Christmas celebration, it is celebrated, but it might be a little smaller scale than what we see in America where tons of people are going out and buying gifts and stores shut down for like Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Um, whereas in Scotland, Christmas might just be another, hol another day. And then Hogmanay, which is their New Year's celebration, is a whole four day affair. So they'll give people a lots of time off around that. So that's when you typically go and visit family if they're far from you or you'll have meals with them and celebrate. So they do celebrate Christmas, but it's not as big as it is here in America. And can you repeat why King George made the kilts illegal? Yeah, so that actually goes back. Um, so Scotland and England kind of had a very tense history. So King George was King of England, but Scotland was also incorporated under um, kind of like a part of England at that time. And so um, his jurisdiction carried over to Scotland. And he was, he was kind of battling um, with uh, resistance in the Highlands. So a lot of the Highlanders just were very opposed to, the, to, an, England, to an English king ruling their territory. And so um, King George, in order to kind of suppress these rebels and easily, it was kind of like a way for him to easily identify the people who were defying him um, and his rules. So he um, outlawed the kilt so that he could um, see if you were wearing a kilt, then you were opposed to my rule is kind of how he rationalized it. Um, so a lot of the Highlanders continued to wear kilts because they, it was part of their identity and part of um, how, they, how they dressed and how they recognized themselves and their clan identity. Um, and so to King George and his armies that were in Scotland, they were able to easily identify kind of rebels or enemies of the state by, based on that dress act. And so it only lasted for a couple of years um, because it, was, it wasn't very effective. I don't think a lot of people followed it because they did see the kilt as a symbol of national pride and patriotism. Um, but yeah, he was essentially a way for him to kind of scout out people who were not fans of him. Um, and why do they dress so fancy in India? <laughs> um, so I guess it would be the equivalent, so because their clothing style is so different, I wouldn't say that to them it's fancy. It's fancy to us because it's different, so we think of like, like for women they typically wear skirts, like we think like, oh, like a skirt is kind of fancy. But that's um, very traditional for women in India, so um, if you think back to like American history when women only wore dresses or women only wore like tops and skirts and women never wore pants, we would consider that you know, fancy now relatively because most women in America tend to wear pants most of the time. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's fancy, but um, a lot of their clothing is adorned. So with me, I have one of the um, shawls that you can typically see in India. So you see like a gold border with these like golden circular accents. And this is actually one of the simpler styles. So women will typically wear it like around their neck like this or over their shoulder or um, it's common to see at funerals with it over their heads. So like it's a symbol of like respect. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's fancy to them. It's all very simple to them and a lot of the time women do wear pants. So like I said in the modern clothing of India women will wear like the top of the solar kameez with leggings. So um, I guess to them it's not really fancy. It's just what they wear. Um, and what are the most popular foods in each of your countries? Some of the common dishes. So in Scotland, um, you've probably heard of haggis if you haven't. Um, haggis is a very traditional food in Scotland that's eaten for many celebrations. Um, and it's a traditional, it's like a sheep's stomach and then a lot of its intestines kind of ground up. It's actually really, I like it a lot. It just tastes like a, it tastes like a hamburger, honestly, if you compare it. It's just neat. Um, but their dish, the traditional dish that they eat for a lot of celebrations is called haggis neeps and tatties. And so that's haggis, what I just mentioned, which is the sheep's meat. Um, and neeps is turnips. And then tatties is potatoes. So it's like a traditional meal of haggis, turnips, and potatoes that are kind of all just on a little dish. Um, and that's just a standard serving that people can have. You can eat it for lunch, dinner, special occasions. It's everywhere in Scotland. Every restaurant you go into probably has a variation on haggis, knees, and tatties. 
Um, so in India, I would say that there are like kind of levels of food. So food is really big in India. So one thing that really comes to mind for me, one of my favorite foods is called, um, well, it's called different things depending on where you are. In some places they're called Golgappa and in some places they're called Bani Puri, which is what I call them from where um, my parents are from, which is more like Northern Central India. Um, so they're like these um, small, like round circular, um, like kind of like pastries, but very light. They're not pastries, it's like pastry dough. And so what you do is they're circular and you kind of poke a hole through the top and you fill it with different things. So there's, um, bani means water. So it's like this type of water that has spices in it. So it's like, you can make it either sweet or spicy. Personally, I like the spicier water. Um, so you add that, you add some, um, roasted chickpeas a lot of time people will add chickpeas um certain kinds of beans and potatoes um and you can also add like different sauces and those are typically like at stalls so a lot, so like india like in india we have restaurants and we have like stalls everywhere so it's kind of like like you would imagine a food truck except they're not trucks and they're everywhere um so like here food trucks are more like you have to call one in type deal um so the that's one of my personal favorites and um, Re other really common ones are um, dosas, which are made of the same really light, um, like dough. It's not dough. I can't think of a batter. It's a really light batter that you fry and then you fold it into like kind of like a cylinder. And you oftentimes will eat it with um, chutney, which is a different kind of sauce, or um, with different like you can add different things. So people will add cheese. A lot of times in America and those are places in America, people will add like chocolate inside them, which I'm personally not a fan of. Um, but you'll also see a lot of different types of um, dishes that feature potatoes, um, different kinds of um, like gravy within the food. There's not really, um, I mean, of course there's foods in India that are like specific to India, but a lot of them are variations on the same thing. Um, so you, those, there'll be like variations with potatoes or variations with chicken. Um, so there's stuff like that. And I don't know if you know this, but if you know anything about working conditions for some of the factories in India by chance? Um, so I can't say that I visited a factory in India, but I will say that um, with like a lot of the things that we learn here, we learn that there are really bad conditions. And I think that um, that is true for some places. So a lot of um this might be a little complicated but a lot of things from america get outsourced to india so like you'll see made in india or like made in china on things and it's because things that we're bringing into america are made in other countries and so it's so it has a lot to do with economy so the um american dollar is worth um 55 rupees or between 45 and 55 depending on what time of year you go so that's like the exchange rate so it's a lot cheaper to produce things in india than it might be to produce them in america so people will often have them made there some of the factory conditions are really bad especially because um like the political infrastructures of India are very complicated because there are so many people there that have so many different interests that it's difficult to represent them. And there's, of course, um, corruption and things that the government does wrong. Um, so I would say that some of them are bad, but I wouldn't say that like all of them are the same. Like we have bad conditions at places here and we have better conditions. So um, it's definitely improving. It's something that there are people are forming unions to improve the conditions. And so they're getting better with time. And what are some of the other holidays that they celebrate in your countries? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I mentioned Hogmanay, which is their New Year's Eve celebration, which is probably one of the biggest celebrations that Scotland does. Um, and then in, on January 25th, every year, um, they have Burns Day or Burns Night, which celebrates a Scottish poet, um, Robert Burns. And he is essentially Scotland's like literary hero. They, he wrote a poem about haggis because he loves it so much. Um, so Scotland loves to read, um, typically they'll read that poem at a big banquet and everyone will dance, they'll have a Kaylee. Um, so Burns Night is a huge celebration for them and that's January 25th. Um, and then as far as other holidays, I, I'm not certain. I do know in Edinburgh, there's a huge summer festival and in August kind of all around Scotland, people consider it to be festival season. So there's tons of music festivals going on. Um, the festival in Edinburgh where I was is called Fringe Festival. So it's essentially, it's a huge deal and 
to me, it was like a holiday because there's so many people there and it's just a huge celebration and there's music and bands and food. And um, so that was a big deal. But Burns Day and Hogmanay, which are both in December and January, are probably two of the biggest holidays that Scotland celebrates. So in India, a lot of the holidays are um, really towards the end of the year. So um, pretty are so earlier this year, probably in around October, September area, there was um, this festival called Navratri, and it r roughly translates to nine nights. It's based on um, a story about um, about war. I can't remember if it's a religious story or if it's just an old like Indian folklore type thing, but essentially like these soldiers go out and for these nine nights, they, um, they are fighting this battle and finally on the ninth night they succeed and so it's this idea that for these whole nine nights like they've been fighting this battle for so long and to celebrate that victory and it's um based on a um the it's like partially religious because the idea is that one particular goddess um helps with this um success and so um, her name is Kali. She's the goddess of um, war. And so that's pretty popular. So what happens at those festivals is um, women will come typically in saris or janya jewelries if you're younger and you can't um, arrange a sari. But women will come and they'll dance in circles. And so there's usually the circles are the biggest is the simplest circle. So the easiest dance. And as you move in, the dance gets more and more complicated with um, typically like the religious figure of Kali in the middle or like an offering to her somewhere in the middle of the all the circles. And um, people dance and there's typically live music at um, whatever the wherever the event is. And um, after that, later in the night, people will um, people will dance, but they'll dance in two um, parallel lines with um, sticks. So it involves like a particular pattern of how you beat your sticks and how you turn in the line. So one line is men typically, and one line is women. Um, and then as you get to the end of the line, you just switch over. So it's like a continuous circle of people just dancing. And it's a, um, it's a really big, like, people tell you not to do this is to join the line without a partner because if there's uneven number of people, there's always one person who gets left out. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, it's called, the sticks are called Dandia. Um, so that's one event, like I mentioned Diwali, which just passed is about, it's like a five day festival. It's um, Indian New Year's. We celebrate a lot of the um, births of the different gods and goddesses. So one particular one that I remember growing up is the birth of um, the god Krishna. And so there's stories about how he used to really like um, churn butter. And so like we'll offer that to him. And then we have a little idol of him that my mom brought back from India and we'll like dress him up and like there are small clothes that, that you're supposed to put on the idol to celebrate like his birthday. So things like that. Um, and what languages do they speak in India? And if you know any languages, can you say like a few words? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Um, so there are a lot of different languages in India. Um, so a lot of people speak English. My, um, my cousins who live in India actually learn, they go to school and they speak only English there. Um, there's a lot, there's um, Tamil, Telugu, there's Hindi, um, and then the one that I speak is Gujarati. Um, so I don't, I'll just say like my name is Shama in Gujarati. So the way you would say that is Marunam Chesama. Um, so in India, like the SH sound doesn't really exist. So like my, my name, like when I'm speaking to people in America, I say Shama, but the way that my parents pronounce my name is Sama. So it's like, the syllables are a little bit different in the way the um, vowels work because um, Indian is a script based language. So it's not like the tri traditional like letters that we see. So there's a little bit of um, a shift in how you say things. Um, what types of shoes do they wear in both countries? So a little bit about shoe fashion, if there's anything <laughs> in particular that you want to share. Um, in Scotland, you better have a good pair of snow boots because it is always very cold and wet. So most people have a very a very good pair of sturdy boots that they're wearing all the time. But it's typically like the same shoes you would see around. There's tons of people who wear just like tennis shoes or sneakers. 
Um, I saw some people wearing flip flops. I would not be doing that. It's too cold for <laughs> those, but people wear all kinds of shoes, just like you see here. Um, but I would say boots are pretty prevalent because it does snow and rain a lot. So you gotta have a good pair of shoes for that. Um, in India, it's a lot of the same. So a lot of people wear like tennis shoes. Um, what's really popular is sandals, especially for men. So like we don't see as many men wear sandals in America, but it's pretty popular there. A lot of their, um, there's not really a lot of like mud there. It's very like dusty is what their soil is like. So um, people will typically wear flip flops or they'll wear um, sandals or like even any type of clothes, toed shoes, like tennis shoes, et cetera. So it's, it's still pretty similar. Um, for fancier occasions, women will wear um, like fancy, like their, their heels, but they're like flip flop heels. Like they've got the two straps and the straps are typically like adorned with some type of like jewel pattern. Um, is the cow still considered holy in India? Yes. So um, there are a lot of different gods and goddesses in India, and one of them is a cow. So we also have a god that's an elephant. So the cow is still considered really holy in India. So even if people aren't vegetarians, they typically won't eat beef at all. Um, there are some places in India where they do, but a lot of people would eat lamb. Um, I personally, the only meat that I eat is chicken. So yes, the cow is still considered very holy in religious practice in India. Um, and there's a question, what traditional symbols do you have in your houses? Or maybe if you, like Mary Glenn, if you brought any souvenirs back from Scotland, or Shama, if you have anything traditional in your parents' home, if you guys want to share. Yeah, so um, in my house, so I have moved twice, but every time there's something that's really consistent about how we um, acknowledge our culture. So a really big thing is that we have like this small version of a temple. So like, it's this like small shrine with like religious figures inside, um, decorated in like these particular cloths that are red. Um, with like gold edges and a big picture of one of the goddesses. So it depends on um, what part of India you're from, like which gods and goddesses are really important to you because there's so many of them. But um, that's something that we have in my house that's really important. We also have um, like this plaque of the Om symbols, like peace essentially. Um, and so we have that in my house. We have um, small religious figures. So when I came to college, my mom gave me this um, like little platform with um, the god that I mentioned earlier that is an elephant inside. Um, that god is called um, Ganesh. And so like I have the small little um, like, so, like figure of him. Um, and there's also things that aren't necessarily particularly Indian, but are featured in our house because of our culture. So out front of my house, we have these um, like elephant, like statues essentially that are very influenced by um, our Indian culture and the Indian God. They don't look like that God, but elephants are still really important in the culture. Um, and then we have a lot of, there's always been something in my house that features a peacock of some kind. So like peacocks are really important in Indian culture, like as a symbol, they're just beautiful um, animals and they're, there are a lot of them in India. So right now I think we have a peacock like painting in the entryway of my house. Um, when I was a kid, we used to have these big vases with um, like not real peacock feathers, but with like fake peacock feathers in them. So just things like that. 